WHCR, good enough for everybody in the whole wide world. This is Brother Leroy, and the program that you're about to hear, Respect for Life, does not reflect the views, attitudes, whims, deeds, or any other proclivities of the management of WHCR, nor that of the administration of City College. However, the program does reflect the research done by the participants in the program who are live and live in color in studio by phone interview. And, of course, there is you, ladies and gentlemen, the first-class citizens of the world, to God belongs the glory, and if we do some good deeds, we will indeed be God's chilling up in here. James Cleveland, good enough for mother, good enough for father, that old-time religion. We're going to be talking about health care this morning and the traditional way of health care that I came up on, and that was a doctor, was, um, you know, called, and that particular doctor that uh, folks called on here in Harlem, USA, was Dr. Bess. Dr. Bess. And that's exactly what he was. He was the best doctor in the whole wide land. And uh, we're going to be talking about a different kind of doctor today, one that cares for the entire family. And Dr. Kalman. Good morning. A great and powerful day to you, my dear brother. You, sir, too. And uh, I'm just in the process of introducing you to our audience. He is the president and CEO of Family Health Care Network. Institute for Family Health is is the real name. Institute for Family Health, and it's exactly what it says. He is uh, in the process of opening up. He and his team opening up a health care center right there at where North General Hospital was and uh, promises to open in early 2013. He'll give us the details on that. But first of all, thank you very much for joining us on Harlem Community Radio, our first interview with you. Yes, good morning. Dr. Kalman, would you share with us the uniqueness of the Institute? for family health. What's so different about that than other facilities that are out here promoting themselves as being for the community or for New Yorkers, et cetera? Well, first of all, um, thank you for having me this morning. And, you know, I, I, I guess what I'd like to say is we're great, but there are a lot of other great providers out there, too. Um, I think some of the things that make us unique is, number one, that we're not for profit. Um, I started the Institute 30 years ago uh, in a small apartment in the Bronx, and we've now grown to uh, nearly 1,000 employees and 30 locations. Um, We are nonprofit, and we take everybody. Um, As far as I know, we've never turned a patient away in all the years that we've been working. Um, We believe that health care is a right that every human being should have, and not just the right to any health care, but a right to the very best health care, um, a right to have their own doctor um, who they can trust and who they can follow um, for years, and a right to have health care that's delivered with uh, the, the best current state of knowledge, mm-hmm. and, and to have health care that's not being driven by doctors who are looking to make a buck or... Um, pharmaceutical companies that are pushing their latest and greatest drugs, um, but something that's based upon what the best evidence is in in healthcare and the best science. How how does a person today, whether they are are just becoming and coming into adulthood or a senior, how do they select a doctor within the framework of an institute you know, they come to the clinic, they come uh, entry. How do how how does one, what's the criteria that the individual, let's say me, that I could begin to utilize to say, you know, I want that doctor over there as opposed to someone saying this doctor will see you? How does it work? Well, I, you know, I think there's all different ways that people pick doctors and that people can. I, you know, I think recommendations from friends and word of mouth is very important. People are smart. Um, They know when they're getting good medical care for the most part. They know when their doctor's sitting in a room looking at them face-to-face, talking to them 
um, in a respectful manner as an equal human being. Um, they know when they're given the time to talk about their issues and problems. Um, they know when they're being sent to good specialists for referrals. Um, but for the most part, you know, I think I think it is it is difficult. Um, you know, I have my own kind of pet things that I that I like to tell people. One is, you know, people should be board certified. I think board certification is very important. Second of all, I think, you know, any doctor that's got a sign up that says that, you know, they expect payment before the patient's even seen, mm. to me that's an immediate turn off. I, okay. I you know, I, I took my mother to a doctor like that a while ago and I just couldn't you know, it the, it ruined the entire experience. You know, for people that are w- more worried about getting paid than they are about taking care of people, mm. to me, that's just an immediate, you know, turn off. And mm. um, I, I think I, I hate going to doctors mm. and seeing all over their desks, you know, pads of paper and pencils and pens and posters and everything with drug company names all over it. Because mm-hmm. then I know the doctors are being influenced by, you know, commercial interests more than they're being influenced by what's what's good and known in medical knowledge. I just, what you just said in terms of the pharmaceutical um, promotion materials, <clears throat> pardon me, promotion materials, pens, et cetera, on the man's desk, or even maybe some caps or something like that. The, the New York Times a couple of Saturdays ago, could have been three Saturdays ago, put some very important news in their Saturday paper in the business section. And that was on a um, a stroke medicine or stroke drug. And if I re, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, I'm I'm on target. Proxata, something Pr- like Pradaxa, Pradaxa, yeah. Pradax, Pradaxa, yeah. And and uh, it caught my attention because the first of all it was on the front page of the business section, and the subhead talked about the number of people who were bleeding out. I'm not looking at the article right now. At the same time, this product had been put on the market and was a billion-dollar product in sales at that time. And it was another case, it is another case of the public being vulnerable to the FDA putting out a drug and it being detrimental to a portion of of the community or or public anyway. Uh, give us some insight into that, that particular drug. It, it talked about bleeding out and they had positioned it to be better than Coumadin and etc. Sure. You know, this is such a, a great example um, because you, when, when these drugs come out, they often have very limited uses, but once they're approved, the pharmaceutical manufacturers start promoting them um, for all kinds of things for which they've not really been tested mm. um, or proven. Because once a drug's approved, it's a doctor's discretion. It's interesting, but the doctor can use the drug for anything they choose. Um, they're not Doctors are not subject to the limitations of what a drug was approved for. The pharmaceutical manufacturers are not allowed to promote the drug for something that it hasn't been proven to be safe and useful for, but the doctors can still use it. So very often there's, you know, these underground conversations that take place between the drug representatives and the doctors, you know, say, well, you know, we're not allowed to promote this, but you should know a lot of your colleagues are using this for X, Y, and Z. So Pradax is interesting because in in some sense it seemed to be a great breakthrough, and it still may be. Um, Here's the issue. You know, for people that are on Coumadin, they have to have their blood checked every, you know, so often, and some every week, every few weeks, um, to make sure that their Coumadin levels are correct. And Coumadin can be a fairly um, dangerous drug because if your blood levels of Coumadin go up too high, you can start bleeding spontaneously. Um, And so it's a drug that's been around for a really long time. It's very inexpensive. Um, The drug companies don't make a lot of money on this anymore because it's been around for such a long time. And um, But it takes a lot of monitoring. So along comes Pradaxa. It's a drug that you can take and doesn't require any monitoring um, at all. Mm. And it maintains your blood levels at pretty much the right level. Problem is, for Coumadin, if somebody starts to bleed, 
they can get an injection of vitamin K, and it reverses the effects of Coumadin. The other blood thinner that people use is heparin, and you can also reverse the effects of heparin with a drug. Pradaxa has no reversing agent, and so it has, you have to wait for it to wear off, which can be days. And so the danger is that if you bleed on Pradaxa, there's no way to reverse the, its effects, and it can take days for the medication to sort of um, get to a point where you, where you stop bleeding. And so that's really the danger and, and why it's overuse um, can be problematic. But for some people who, you know, can't get back and forth to doctors or have had trouble maintaining Coumadin levels or who are on drugs that interfere with Coumadin levels, Pradaxa might be a lifesaver. But all of these things have to be used, you know, within the, the bounds of current knowledge and not the way, you know, uh, these, these blockbuster drugs are often, are often promoted by the pharmaceutical industry. In the Institute, in, in terms of your mandate to the doctors who work for you and the nurses, et cetera, the, the drugs are, quote, that's a quick fix. What aspect of holistic health care is involved in the, the practice of medicine at the Institute for Family Health? Well, we like to view people broadly and, and, first of all, try to understand their own health beliefs. So we have a lot of patients who, you know, come from traditional backgrounds where herbal medications have been used for a long time, and we have doctors who are trained in using herbal medications. Um, we, you know, we, we like to work in conjunction with the kinds of remedies and things that people are taking. You know, a lot, <clears throat> it's interesting, but a lot of the sort of home remedies, so to speak, that people have used for, for generations are now being accepted and studied and proven to be of great value um, by, by medical science. And so, you know, we try not to poo-poo any of this stuff, but to build on it, to use the things that people are already doing and to supplement them when needed. So we have, uh, you know, we have people who do um, homeopathy. We have folks who do herbal medications. We have a number of acupuncturists in our centers. Um, you know, not all of our centers have these services available all the time, but, they're, but they are available to our patients. And we believe in them because we believe, you know, in the mind, body, spirit sort of totality that you can't separate these things and that they're all part of, uh, of, of one person. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest online is Dr. Neil Kalman. He is the president and CEO of the Institute for Family Health, which has a number of locations in the metro area. The, new, the, the most current one that's going to open is in the facility that was formerly North General. And if you go over that area right uh, east of Marcus Garvey Park, you'll see construction going on. What is the expansion involved with that site right now that uh, is going to, you know, be the Institute for Family Health? Yeah, so let me um, explain what's happening because there's a lot, of, a lot of change in that, in that neighborhood right now. So the old North General Hospital and the tower that's being built behind it are actually going to be part of the Health and Hospitals Corporation, and they're moving the Kohler and Goldwater facility patients off of Roosevelt Island into oh, those towers okay. when they'll be done. The idea is to free up that land in Roosevelt Island um, for the new tech center that the, that the mayor is right. talking about. Okay. So we're in that space temporarily in the, in the clinic area where the North General Clinics used to be. But we actually have nothing to do with the old North General Hospital. We, um, we took on the patients from there, the mental health, dental, and, um, and pr pr primary care patients mm -hmm. from there um, at the request of the state and other parties when, we, when, when the hospital closed. We are moving into a brand new facility, which many of you may have seen, on the corner of 119th and Madison. It was the old hospital annex building, and it is, we're just completing a $30 million renovation of that building. It will be 38,000 square feet, five floors of state-of-the-art um, healthcare facility. And that will be, so we're open in the, in the ground floor of the old hospital now, 
and but we're moving out of there. That that's an antiquated, you know, mm-hmm. facility that doesn't really um, lend for the kind of care that we give. And we'll be moving on December seventeenth. We'll be in the new facility and um, ready to go there. And there'll be a whole floor of dental services. We'll have fourteen dental chairs and dental operatories. There'll be a urgent care center on the first floor for people that have, um, you know, urgent medical needs. And there'll be three floors of medical care and um, and a whole floor of mental health facilities. Hmm. And uh, that's on the west side of Madison. Exactly, on the south southwest corner of Madison right. and 119th. <laughs> I'm always passing the building. I never look up. I just go under the scaffold. <laughs> I never looked up. Well, look up because you'll <laughs> see that it's beautiful. We've torn down a lot of the old, huge, thick brick that was on the building to make it look more yeah. inviting. I don't know how anybody else <laughs> felt about that building, but to me it looked like a prison. Um, so we, we did quite a bit of renovation on the exterior. But but really what people will find is yeah. a completely – um, an ultra modern facility, a beautiful facility. We build our facilities um, as if they were being built for the wealthiest people um, in in the heart of uh, of Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. you know everybody deserves to be treated with that level of respect mm-hmm. and to go into a facility that's spotless and um, and that and that people can feel confident mm-hmm. in. Very interesting. Your Compassion, and I'm not using that, you know, loosely. This this is in the writings that are are, are on Google relative <clears throat> to you. This relates to the the family approach that you you have based on what I've read and what I've heard. Where does that emanate from? Well, <clears throat> sorry, people. You know, I don't. I I I think it's it's hereditary. Uh, my grandfather, uh, Maurice Kalman, was a socialist alderman in Harlem um, in the 19, I guess around 1918, 1919. He was a, an attorney. He was um, he, he was a lawyer, uh, a, a oral surgeon, and he just he fought. You know, he spent his whole life fighting for free health care, dental health care for people in New York. Um, my dad was an oral surgeon. He practiced in Washington Heights his whole life and sort of had the same kind of passion. So I guess I, I was the renegade in the family. I went into medicine and not dentistry, mm-hmm. but with the same, I think, passion that they had for mm-hmm. taking care of everybody and, um, you know, and, and making sure that 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 people – Got the the medical care that that they deserve, and um, and it's 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 been incredibly rewarding. There's nothing more rewarding than having people be amazed when they walk out of one of our centers that they have finally found a place that they can call their medical home, mm-hmm. and um, and where they feel comfortable. I can't say it works perfectly all the time. Healthcare is really tough. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can wake up in the morning. There could be an epidemic of some stomach flu and the place can be overwhelmed and people can end up waiting for a few hours to get care Mm -hmm. i mean it's you know it's not it's not sort of a predictable kind of business but it is um the way we run our centers we we really we try to do the best we can so for example one of the things i think that's most unique and i learned this from my dad um our centers are open from 8 a.m. to midnight, Monday mm. through Friday, mm. and all day Saturday and Sunday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Mm. And, you know, we do that because what are you saying to people if you're open 9 to 5? You're basically saying, well, if you have a job, you know, take off. We're more important mm. than you are. You know, you need to take your take off from your job in order to come and see us. But, I, you know, I think that's a ridiculous way to practice medicine. You're saying to the families with kids, you know, take your kid out of school to come and see the doctor because, you know, we close at 5 o'clock. Well, the kids come out of school at 3 o'clock. How much time does that give you to get your children to a, to a exactly. doctor to get their checkups? Exactly. So, you know, you can have a primary care doctor. Our doctors work the same sessions week after week. So if you, you know, if you come in on Monday evening, you can get a regular checkup. This isn't just open in the evenings for urgent or emergency care. It's open for regular primary care and mental health services.
services. So you can have a regular doctor who you'll see, and they'll be there every Monday evening, and they can be your regular doctor to care for your blood pressure, your diabetes, or whatever. Mm. And here's a going back to your initial statements about accepting or receiving patients, not ever turning anyone down based on your knowledge at, at the institutes. The Here's an individual, female, in her 50s, lost a job two years ago, doesn't have any insurance, not on welfare, not on food stamps, because the, what do you call the um, unemployment, they designate yep. as being... Um, more above the threshold. So they, right. they, and they are in need of various care. Um, they come to the institute doors. What happens? So, for, <clears throat> first of all, um, they'll get an appointment like everybody else. We have people who are superb at talking to people about benefits, and more than half the people in this state and probably even a higher percentage of people in the city who think they're uninsured and not eligible for anything are actually eligible for some type of health care benefits. There are all kinds of products, both Family Health Plus, Child Health Plus, um, and other kinds of products that people are available, uh, that that people may be be available to people. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is, um, so we'll talk to them about that, but irrespective of that, um, we work on what's called a sliding fee scale. So this is uh, mandated because we are a federally qualified health center. So the, the federal government, um, because we meet certain very stringent requirements of quality and access, the federal government designates us as a federally qualified health center. And so we work on a sliding fee scale. So people might pay um, $20 for a whole visit. Um, people might pay, mm. you know, forty dollars if they're making a certain amount of money for a visit, mm. or they might pay nothing. Mm. And um, and when they pay nothing, they get the same exact care. Our doctors have no idea um, whether the patients are, you know, perfectly insured with some private commercial insurance company on Medicaid or on Medicare. It'll show up in their chart. They treat everybody exactly the same way. Um, because they get paid the same irrespective of the patients that they're seeing. So the doctors have no incentives to treat people differently. And so they'll get exactly the same care that anybody else gets. And if they're eligible for benefits, we'll try to get them on benefits, not just so that we can collect a little money um, from whoever covers them, but also because if somebody needs to go to an emergency room or needs to go to the hospital, we might see them for free, but we can't control what happens to them outside the system. Right. So it's always better for people to have some sort of benefits. And fortunately, because we, re- we re-elected our good president, we're very hopeful that mm. through health reform, a lot more of these people will be eligible for um, health care. Ladies and gentlemen, you are hearing some great news for many of you, and this is an opportunity for you to call in if you have questions, you want to join in the conversation. You'll be speaking with Dr. Neil Kalman, and he is the president and CEO of the Institute for Family Health, which has a number of locations in the Northeast. Our telephone number, 212-650-6903, 212-650-6903. Talking about mental health, and I'm looking at uh, drugs street drugs and also so-called, you know, pharmaceutical drugs. Here's an individual who was brought into the, let's say they come to your hospital or or any hospital, and they are off. People know that when I say off, they are demonstrating erratic um, behavior, and they may have taken their clothes off in the street whatever the situation is, or they may have had a weapon disarmed and they're brought in. Now, based on the kind of drugs that are in in the community and in the U.S. in general, how does one separate a person who's had a nervous breakdown from a person who 
in terms of treatment, separate from a person who has smoked some marijuana that has acid? Well, <clears throat> you know, it's very difficult to, you know, you can't look at somebody and, and see what's what's wrong. I mean, a lot of people with mental illness will turn to drugs in order to almost self-medicate mm -hmm. with their mental illness, right? Mm -hmm. So people who, you know, have tremendous anxiety will start taking downers and mm -hmm. and, and doing things to, to sort of compensate for that. And at the, <clears throat> at the same time, you know, people who get involved in drugs can become psychotic just from the use of the drugs. Exactly. So the first thing, you, you know, we try to do is get them into a safe, safe environment. I mean, you have to provide for people's safety first. And, you know, sometimes that means trying to convince them to be hospitalized for a short period of time so that they can be detoxified from all the stuff that's in their body and um, and, and you can sort of see then what their baseline is and, and see what kind of um, psychological or mental problems might underlie that. But it's, you know, it, you ask a very, very difficult question. I mean, the combination of substance use and mental illness is a very, it's a, it's a tangled web that's very, very hard to um, untangle. And some people say that in the face of, you know, drug use, you can't really make a, a psychiatric diagnosis mm. because you can't separate out the effects of the drugs from what might be underlying. Mm. So, you know, this is, this is why we have mental health professionals working with us all the time. Um, you know, just like people can see doctors when they walk in off the street, we have mental health professionals available almost every hour that we're open, including all those extended hours I talk to, because you need expertise in these areas. You can't, you know, this isn't something just um, anybody can can do. This requires special training and, and, and um, a special sense of patience and understanding of what people's lives are like and what may have driven them to this point in their life to, you know, to start using drugs or or to, you know, to be experiencing the kind of mental anguish that we sometimes see in our, in our patients when they first come in. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Respectful Life. I'm your host, Brother Leroy. On the line is Dr. Neil Kalman, and the station emanates from the campus of City College in Harlem, USA. WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. Telephone number if you care to join in the conversation, ask a question, observation, 212-650-6903, 212-650-6903. Going back to holistic um, health, being appreciative of what's going on in, in alternative healing or people coming in who may have used or been on the the use of uh, herbal remedies, etc. Your point was that there are home remedies, what were designated as home remedies uh, yesteryear, are now being studied in the various in various institutes institutions around the country for practical use in in a regular medicinal form. Baylor University in Texas. Uh, appears to be an advanced uh, institute that uses all types of of approaches to healing. What is your knowledge of Baylor Institute, Baylor University, or any other institution that has uh, incorporated um, even prayer as a form of or an additional form of healing? Well, I don't know uh, of Baylor, but I can tell you that. Um the more I learn and the more I've been involved in medicine, the more I realize that the things that heal people are so individually determined. Um, this is not a, you know, sort of one-size-fits-all kind of a situation, you mm -hmm. know, where somebody comes in with this problem, you give them this medication, and they get better. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really about trying to understand what people believe um, about what's happening to them, and very often those beliefs are at least as important as the illness that you're diagnosing. Um, you know, somebody might say, you know, I really believe that, that you know, I'm being punished, right. that, that I'm being punished for something bad that I did, you know, two years ago. Um, and guilt becomes a huge factor, and until you help them with that particular issue, either, you know, through 
a um, a spiritual leader, mm-hmm. or or through uh, mental health care, or or just by talking to them in in a in a doctor's office. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, you can throw all the medications you want at them, but un- unless they think they 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 can get better, you know, many times they won't. And we've all heard about these situations where people have, you know, been given fatal illnesses and all this stuff, and they pop right back. Exactly. And, and they, you know, they recover, and the whole world, including their doctors, are amazed. Right. <laughs> There's so much that we don't know in this area, and I, I just try to teach everybody that it, what's really important is that we have to approach every patient with an open mind. Okay, hold your point right there while we go to our first call. Caller, sure. thank you for your patience. You're on the air. Salam alaikum, my brother, well, alaikum and thank salam. you, doctor, for being on this program. It's so enlightening. Uh, I'm listening. This is Brother Omar calling from the village of Harlem. Happy holidays to everyone also. Uh, first of all, I, w- I just want to bring up two points. I have, I have a good friend of mine who works uh, for the federal government. Uh, he's uh, going into his senior years, and he had to have two, excuse me, he had to have three heart procedures, uh, tr- transplants. The first two didn't work. The third one, thank God, is working. This man has uh, just turned 64. Uh, he was with Blue Cross. I remember uh, Blue Cross Medical Insurance. He, he'd been paying into this insurance company for over 25 years. Now, keep in mind, this man works f- uh, for the government. Do you know that Blue Cross had a nerve to cut him off and tell him that he could no longer be one of their clients because of the third procedure that he had to have? Now, this gentleman uh, is looking for a um, health company. Now, first of all, I want to I want to I want to tie this in with uh, I was fortunate enough to live in Canada for the past 18 years, as Brother Leroy knows. Up there, you get free you get you get free attention. There's no such thing as that you have to have this, that, and the other. Everything is government controlled, thanks to the late Prime Minister uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Now, take this whole scenario, and I'm, I'm I'm thinking about the documentary by Michael Moore. Listening to this brother Sicko, I don't know if you ever saw that uh, documentary Sicko. Yes. How people, when they get sick, uh, this government just throws them, kicks them to the curb, actually, when, when they reach into their senior years. Whereas if you go to France, if you go to uh, the Scandinavian countries, I mentioned Canada, all, all, I mean, all the other countries are laughing at this particular program. Now, getting back to this scenario with the brother who had, uh, the brother works for the government, uh, he tried to even get Obamacare. And he said that they that Obamacare hasn't really hasn't even kicked in for the next couple of years, and so he's left in limbo. Now, how would he? How would you approach someone like him? And and what advice would you give this gentleman? Because I'm taping this show, brother Leroy. What advice would you give this gentleman? Thank you. I'll hang up and listen to your response. And by the way, happy birthday, Malik. It's his birthday tomorrow. Okay. Salam alaikum. Malikum salam. God bless you. Well. You know, you, that's, you've brought up so many complicated issues. That, so the first thing is, you know, the fact that in, in this Thanksgiving, one of the things I'm going to be thankful for is the re-election of our good president. Mm. Um, you know, we are about to engage in a revolution in the way health care is financed that will open up the doors for lots of people and close a lot of these insurance loopholes that have existed for years. I mean, if we don't take control of these health insurance companies, we are in deep, deep trouble and will continue to be. The fact that somebody can be turned down in the middle of a critical illness for coverage is is one of the features that Mm. the president has put into his health plan. That door will be shut tight. Um, on insurance companies. So hopefully this kind of a situation won't ever happen again. But there are, what I've found in healthcare is you can find great hearted people everywhere. And, you know, you have to look around hard. There's, there are public hospital systems in New York. The big heart in New York healthcare is the Health and Hospitals Corporation, which treats absolutely everybody, never turns a patient away. Um, and provides really superb care. Um, and so, you know, that's if if somebody were in New York, I would help them 
get connected if they needed surgery like this or they needed to, to get mm. this kind of intensive follow-up mm -hmm. with, uh, with the Surgeon at Health and Hospitals Corporation. Mm -hmm. And that would be, you know, it would be Bellevue. Hopefully in a few months when Bellevue reopens, it'll be Bellevue again. Um, but those are, you know, there's always places for people to go. What, you, what they need is they need doctors who are going to advocate for them, you know, who are going to basically not go to bed at night until they have found a source of care for every single person and their patient that needs it. And I will tell you that's one of the things that drives good doctors. You know, they, they, they take on every responsibility like this. I can't imagine somebody like this being just put out in the street, you know, and saying, well, you know what, go find somebody who will continue to take care of you you know, without mm. your without the insurance coverage that you have, mm. but hopefully this kind of being thrown off of insurance just won't be able to happen anymore. And um, and this is right around the corner. Uh, in the meantime, you you're if I'm correct, you indicated that you would connect that person with a doctor in the Health and Hospital Corporation. Is that? Yeah, it, and I would. I I, I didn't catch whether I thought. He said, I, I didn't catch whether the person was in New York or not, but um, in New York, you know, we're very fortunate. We probably have the best public hospital system anywhere um, in the country, but there are public hospitals uh, around the country, and um, and they are mandated to provide care to everyone. Exactly. And, and so if people get turned down from the private hospital system somewhere and some doctor that's been taking care of them, and by the way, this story is not unique. I cannot tell you how many times we hear the exact same story. Somebody has a, a doctor, you know, who's been taking care of their cancer for 15 years, and they switch jobs, um, and they switch jobs, and they switch insurance companies, and the new insurance company won't take them in. And uh, and all of a sudden they find themselves, you know, and they go back to their regular doctor. The person who's been taking care of them, their regular doctor says, sorry, I don't take your, your new insurance. And they just mm. throw them right out on the street after years of mm. taking care of them. You know, these kinds of things, unfortunately, you know, are, are, are parts of, of the pathology of our health care system. And Canada has a great system. Um, unfortunately, you know, not not – not something I see our country moving mm -hmm. to anytime soon. Telephone number 212-650-6903. We only have a few more minutes with Dr. Neil Kalman, and he is the president and CEO of the Institute for Family Health. A number of locations. You have Bronx locations. You have lower Manhattan locations, and soon a East Harlem, Harlem location on uh, 119th Street and Madison Avenue. When you you look at your your great grandfather and your father in terms of their uh, dental pursuits, I have a question relating to that. After we take this call, God bless you. Thank you for your call. You're on the black air. Yeah, God God bless you, Brother Leroy. Thank I just you. Have a quick question for your guest. I I like to know is the insurance company more important to America than the patient? I mean... It, no, your question. Is that your question? Yes, that's the question. Okay. okay. Well, well, we should have a health care system that would make people think that, don't we? No. Um, I mean, it, the insurance companies and their decisions and their um, the, the ways that they pay for things and don't pay for things and the, the rules that they put... Um, they really have become dominant in this country. You know, they control a lot of what doctors do, what medications they prescribe, what procedures they can get approved. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a difficult problem. Um, you know, one could imagine a, a world without insurance companies where, you know, there's a national health insurance program like there is in Canada. And the gentleman before, mm -hmm. you know, spoke about the Canadian system. Um, the, these are systems that work. They they provide better care, um, greater longevity, fewer disparities between the kind of health care outcomes that people of color and 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 whites have in in this country, um, and they do it at a cost less than half of what we spend per person on health care. So you know how can you knock a system that that costs half as much, gets better outcomes, and is available to everybody? But unfortunately, you know, the insurance industry in this country is huge. 
and to dismantle it, I think, is something beyond the political mm-hmm. ability mm-hmm. of any of our <laughs> elected officials, you know, even our good president, that the, the powers that be, um, you know, and, and the pharmaceutical industry as well, you know, has a very tight control because imagine if there was a national health insurance plan that basically said, hey, we're not overpaying for these. We're not paying mm-hmm. For any of these new medicines, unless they're used exactly the way they were tested and for exactly the the uses for which we've approved them, you know nobody wants that level uh, of not, I, I shouldn't say nobody, but the the companies, the insurance companies, and the pharmaceutical companies don't want that level of government control. Well, for my opinion, the best thing we could have would be more government control over the kind of health care and the access to health care. Because I don't see that as anything that would threaten the individual doctor from making decisions that are in the best interest of their patients. In fact, I think it would help us. Regarding your your dad and your grandfather, what did you learn from them as to the impact of bad teeth on the entire body and the mind? (laughs) Oh, wow. My dad was a maniac about stuff like this. You know, he... He believed, you know, and I and I think if you think about it, the mouth, you know, it's where we communicate. Um, it sustains us in terms of our our food and nutrition, and it's so important for people to have good teeth. There's been studies that prove that people with good teeth have find it easier to get a job. Um, that when you show people a picture of somebody with good teeth and somebody with bad teeth, they immediately think the person with bad teeth is less intelligent Mm. and poor. Um, You know, there's all kinds of things about self-image. And so, you know, we we are really, um, we've built up a big dental program within our organization, you know, and I hope to be able to name the new dental suite that we're doing in honor of my grandfather Mm. and my father because... You know, not only did I learn about the importance of those aspects of dental care, but now there's more and more data coming out that bad dental hygiene can also be a precursor to heart disease, that it can cause growth problems in children. You know, we we just it's just so it's it's uh, it's so important, and I I, people should be able to walk around with a good set of teeth and um, feel good about themselves and be able to eat normally and uh, be able to converse normally. I think that's just, uh, it should be, it should be like medical care, a basic right for everybody. And uh, your location in lower Manhattan is? Uh, well, we have a, a center on 13, East 13th Street. We have a center on 16th Street um, between 5th Avenue and Union Square. And we're currently in Harlem on 122nd Street in Madison in the in the ground floor of the old North General Building, right. but soon moving to 119th, as we said before, in Madison um, in the old Hospital Annex Building, which has been completely um, sort of renovated. And if, in, you know, if you want to look up any of our sites, you can go to our website, which is www.institute2000, that's 2000.org. And everything is right there. And um, primary care means what, literally? Well, it's it's the point of first contact okay. um, for patients with the health care system. And it's the place, you know, we use the new term medical home. It's the place where you should be able to go for any problem you have, no matter how complex, and have somebody be able to um, help you sort through how to use the healthcare system and to be your advocate in the larger healthcare system. And the telephone number here 212-650-6903 212-650-6903. You'll be on the air with Dr. Neil Kalman. He's the president CEO of the Institute for Family Health and I want to thank brother Reggie for setting up this interview, a very informative interview enlightening all of us as to what we are entitled to and what we can expect December 17th is that the date that's the date we'll be opening in our new facility excellent and family physician that's your designation that's the designation as opposed to what well internal medicine where uh, our primary care doctors that only take care of adults um, pediatricians are primary care doctors that take care of children and family physicians are primary care doctors that take care of the whole family 
And so our family physicians, you know, I mean, my own practice, we often see have multi-generational families. We're taking care of the grandparents, uh, the parents, the children. Uh, many of our family physicians actually deliver babies. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they, you know, they're doing general medical care in the old-fashioned way, but with the latest technology and with board certification and with very advanced training in their field. So they're, they're set up to take care of the whole family, but they do so um, part of a network of very sophisticated specialists who are available to us when needed. Excellent. We have another caller. Caller, turn your radio down. Thank you for your call. You're on the black air. Oh, good morning. Good morning, ma'am. I'm very interested in this program. I just switched my radio channel, and it sounds very good to me. Fantastic. I'm a Medicaid patient, mm-hmm. and I've been many, to many dental. I'm also a diabetic, mm-hmm. and I have crowns in my mouth. At the time I was working, and I paid for those crowns, and each dentist I went, they said they cannot, they cannot fix it because Medicaid does not cover it. Okay. Now, I would like to know, what should I do? Could, could I come to your institution? So, Doctor. So Doctor? Me- Medicaid, unfortunately, has extremely, extremely restricted care um, that they pay for in, in, in the area of dentistry. And it, it really, in my mind, is a, is a tragedy. They'll sometimes pay to have a tooth pulled, but they won't pay to have it restored. Mm. And so... You know, we try to work within the Medicaid guidelines, but we will do things that Medicaid doesn't cover because you heard me say before that, you know, that we try to take care of everybody and do the best that we can for everybody. So within, you know, within reason, people would, first of all, they would need to do an evaluation. You'd have a full evaluation done. um, And then you would talk to one of our dentists about a treatment plan. And it would be something that, you know, I'm sure would satisfy you. And uh, where would they go uh, if they needed it now? They would have to go down the Lower East Side or no, wait no, a couple we have weeks? No, d- no, dentistry is open right now in the ground floor of the old North General Building. Okay. It's open there, but we only have, uh, I think, four operatories there now that are functioning. But we'll have 14 operatories. And um, actually, the faculty from the Mount Sinai School of Medicine uh, Dentistry Program is moving over to our center when we open the new facility. So we'll, we will have access to the best mm. to the best specialists in dentistry um, that you could find anywhere um, in another few weeks. So if it's not urgent and you want to wait a few weeks, I would suggest um, waiting till just after the new year when everything is up and ready to go, and we'd be glad to um, to see you. And uh, in the meantime, <clears throat> pardon me, the North General Hospital location uh, on the ground floor is where uh, someone would go right now to begin right. uh, at least a, um, what do you call it, a general evaluation. Yes, they could do that. And we have a great prostodontist, which is somebody who specializes in exactly the kinds of problems uh, that you have. Prostodontist. Mm-hmm. Or endodontist. Okay. That's what, that's what I would like to see. I'm very interested. I'm going to wait for the new center. All right. Uh, you uh, gave me the telephone number, and also, if Medicaid doesn't cover my tooth, my teeth, uh, could I have a sliding scale that I pay? Absolutely, you would have a sliding scale. No okay, question. Okay, great. Okay, that'll be at 1879 Madison. I'm looking at. No, that's the North General location right, right now. Uh, telephone number two one two. Four two three four five hundred two one two four two three four five hundred and thank you for your call, ma'am. Thank you so much, and this is a great opportunity for a lot of a lot of people underprivileged than the privileged too. Excellent. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much, and the destitute, because you know this is a very good program, program, and I commend you. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening, and everyone out there, thank you for your support of WHCR, we're always asking you to make a contribution based on the fact that you get information here that you do not get anywhere else. It could be that you could get it anywhere else, but you don't have this particular approach on getting information 
from our specialists who appear in these programs. 212-650-6903. We only have time for one more call. 212-650-6903. And um, I had one of those. Uh, okay, you, you've just been named to uh, head up the departments at Mount Sinai, right? Yeah, I've been. Um, I'm heading up a new department of family medicine at Mount Sinai Medical School and at Mount Sinai Hospital. So it, there is such a thing as Superman. They call you Super Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a second. That. Hold on a second. My wife calls me overworked, but it's, <laughs> she the, said, uh, you know, it's 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 a passion. It's what keeps it what what keeps my juices going. But I think the connection with Mount Sinai is extraordinary for us yeah. because it means that our patients now have access to the very best specialists that are available anywhere in the world. And mm. um, we are working to sort of bridge that connection. It also means that for people that come to our centers that need to be hospitalized, that we'll be able to uh, hospitalize okay. them at Mount Sinai, where our own doctors take care of them in consultation with, you know, whatever specialists people might need. So I think it's it's going to step up even beyond where we are now, our ability to do, you know, phenomenal care. and. And I should say, that's not our only hospital affiliation. Mm -hmm. We have a fantastic affiliation with Beth Israel that we've had for 20 years in lower Manhattan with Montefiore up in the Bronx, um, with Bronx Lebanon up in the Bronx. Um, and so, you know, people have choices um, okay. where they can be hospitalized if they need if they need hospitalization. And hold, hold on, Doc. Sure. Uh, we have this last caller. Thank you for your patience. You're on the black ear. Yeah, and do they do ultrasound of the breast? Ultrasound on the breast, as opposed to um, uh, yes, they do it. At, they do it at, in the uh, in the center that we refer to at Mount Sinai, and also in a number of community facilities that we use for um, breast imaging. Oh, okay. they don't do it over there. We we don't do the only imaging that we do is where we are installing um, a film, uh, a uh, an X-ray machine that will do sort of urgent images. But we, you know, the t the in order to get the best technology and the best technique and the best technicians, there are centers all over the city. Um, so we're not trying to build another one of those. In fact, there's one right across the street from us um, on Madison Avenue. And so, and they do breast imaging, breast ultrasound. Is that is that the uh, Ralph Lauren place? Well, Ralph Lauren is affiliated with a whole other right. set of, of, um, of facilities, but there's Madison Avenue Radiology, which is right across... From us, and then also the folks at Mount Sinai who are increasingly okay for for images like that. All right. Okay. What is that a walk-in clinic? Wh wh which one? What are you referring to? The one across to? the street. No, no, it's an X-ray facility. You have to be referred by your oh. primary care doctor. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you sure. for your call. Yeah. Dr. Neil Kalman, we are at the end of a very informative interview. I want to thank Reggie for setting this up. And uh, look forward to interacting with you in the future again. And uh, any parting comment that you have, uh, we have a minute. Just, just to say thank you um, and how important it is for folks like you, Brother Leroy, to be able to um, bring this information to people. Because I, I think, you know, there's a lack of really good information about what good health care is out in the community and you're doing a great service to people by bringing this information and i look forward to working with you again in the future thank you dr neil kalman ceo and president of the institute for family health opening a new facility december 17th right here on madison avenue on 119th street look forward to working with you also god bless you and your family you too and have a happy thanksgiving to you and your listeners thank you Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your support of WHCR. Very, very important. Please take this number down. Write this number down. I'll tell you what it relates to. 347-213-5552. 347-213-5552. This is a young lady who is a very, very honest individual, and she is an insurance specialist. And that means that you can call, ask her questions about the types of insurance, not medical insurance, but 
you know, what you call estate planning uh, insurance, otherwise life insurance, burial insurance, etc., and uh, leaving a trust for your children, your grandchildren, etc. Her name is Aurelia, 347-213-5552. A very honest individual. Give her a call and ask her about the services that she represents, and she is an honest insurance person. And she wouldn't try to run up the game on you. You know, other people say, hey, you need this. No, she'll give you exactly estimate of what you need. May God continue to bless all of you. Always support WACR and the fantastic programming we have here. God bless you. Greetings. This is Honey from Harlem 411. Tune in to Harlem 411 Friday nights at 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. For information on health, education, housing, community events, and more. Harlem 411 serves information to you with the opportunity to call in with your questions. Harlem 411, produced to serve the community's needs. Let us serve you with information. Friday night, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Harlem 411. If you or someone you know is receiving federal benefits from Social Security, Veterans Affairs, Railroad Retirement Board, Office of Personnel Management, or the Department of Labor, this 